Eminon, are you in chat? Are you in chat, Eminon? I'm so f***ing sorry I made you play this. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. I hate this game, lol. This deck does not have a one-card combo. I'm recognizing this. Pass. Eminon, I am so f***ing sorry. <laughs> Droll again. Kaleido chick battle phase droplet in damage. Oh, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. Hey, what's up guys, Sir Amanon here and welcome to another video. So earlier this week, I had the pleasure of participating in MBT's custom ban list tournament, which if you guys are unfamiliar, is a long running series on his channel, where essentially once every format, he tries to ruin Yu-Gi-Oh as much as humanly possible by unbanning about one third to a half of the ban list. And this, as you can imagine, it creates a lot of chaos and confusion for everyone involved. But this time in particular, he went above and beyond in his, in his ambition because he unbanned a grand total of 95 cards, which is a lot more than is, you know, reasonable. And it left a lot of questionable cards in the format. But that being said, I think that as a result, it kind of created a more uh, fun and entertaining experience for both the players and especially the viewers at home watching. Uh, so first, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you for Joseph for running the tournament, as well as the mods and admins for making sure that everything ran smoothly. I think it was a huge success and this was a really just a great experience and a ton of fun to play in. Uh, just also shout outs to my fellow competitors for uh, showing off some really, really cool lists. It was awesome seeing everything in action. So if you guys do want to check out the video in its entirety, definitely check out MBT's video, which I will link in the description and in the pinned comment. Uh, that would just simply be the full VOD uh, from the Twitch stream on Wednesday uh, for you guys to check out. But for the purposes of this video, we're just going to be simply focusing exclusively on the perspective of this deck before you, which is Lunalite. So among the 95 cards that he graciously unbanned, uh, one of them was in fact Lunalite Tiger, which is a card that I actually was advocating for him to include in this tournament series for about a year now. And it definitely did not happen because I bribed him by gifting five subs to his Twitch channel did not happen. So as a result, I decided to bring to this tournament the deck list that I felt was the most representative of Lunalite Tiger's power and potential in this format, and then see how it would compare to the other meta strategies, as well as the crazy decks enabled by the custom ban list. And so this video is going to be broken up into three basic sections. The first is going to be theory oriented, uh, based on historical context and why Lunalite Tiger is banned to begin with, followed by the motivation behind the choices that I made in the deck list that you see before you. The second one is going to be me going over the replays from my own perspective. So if you guys have questions coming over from Joseph's video, uh, I will be happy to answer them both in the comments and hopefully I'll answer most of them in this video. And the third and final part will simply just be a greater discussion on as objectively as possible, can Lunalite Tiger come off the ban list? So for those of you guys who did not play when Lunalite was meta, I'd be happy to give you a brief rundown as to why Lunalite Tiger is currently banned. So before 2019, Lunalite was primarily known as a you know kind of rogue archetype that excelled in OTKing but didn't have a lot of flexibility beyond that. However, in January 2019, we got a lot of really, really powerful support cards that significantly bolstered the strength of this archetype. So we got cards such as Emerald Bird, which was great at setting up your graveyard, as well as getting your fresh draws and being extender as well with its graveyard effect. We had cards like Serenade Dance, which also helped you set up your graveyard while getting resources directly from your deck. And then finally, and most importantly, we got Lunalite Yellow Martin, which was a fantastic extender that allowed you to abuse an interaction with the copy of Tiger that we see in the main deck right here. This was the non once per turn monster reborn of the archetype that allowed you to just keep looping resources over and over again. So with the release of these cards, Lunalite became a very, very small but effective shell for spitting out rank 4s and late materials like it's no tomorrow. And the deck underwent a lot of evolutions throughout 2019, but by far the most competitive one was the Lunalite Orcus variant in the July 2019 format. This was when Nightmare Mermaid was being splashed into pretty much every deck, and any two monsters was infamously known for just becoming the Orcus combo, and Lunalite was no exception to this. However, this deck allowed you to abuse a lot of very, very cool synergies, things like Azathoth to prevent you from hand traps, Curious to be able to send you either Lunalite pieces or the Orcus pieces, and of course, the fact that you were able to just loop over and over again into powerful rank 4 and Orcus plays. And so during the July 2019 format, Lunalite Orcus was actually positioned to be one of, if not the best decks in the entire game. And actually, fun fact, this was the deck that I used to take to YCS Niagara and earn my first YCS top ever. So, you know, this deck is always going to hold a special place in my heart personally. 
But, you know, even moving beyond the October 2019 ban list, which did in fact ban Nightmare Mermaid and thus kill the Orcus engine in this deck, you know, the deck still underwent some very, very powerful evolutions. Uh, for example, heading into 2020, we got some adjacent Time Thief support, which actually pushed the deck alongside that direction for a while. And then heading into uh, April 2020, aka the Master Rule 5 revisions, we were about to get the set Dual Overload, which would inject a lot of power into the strategy with the introduction of Raid Raptor Wise Tricks. However, that lasted for all about 13 days before the April 2020 ban list came and chopped Lunalite Tiger off the uh, off the game, I suppose, alongside Spiral Master Plan, thus killing both of those two strategies as they were the top two prevailing strategies at the time. And that's pretty much it for the timeline for us here. You know, Lunalite Tiger has been sitting on the ban list for just about two years now, and during this entire time, Lunalite as an archetype pretty much has seen no competitive play whatsoever. However, with Tiger coming to 1 on MET's custom ban list, I figured that this would just be the perfect opportunity to sort of pick up some of the remnants of the older y Strix builds that I crafted for the post-dual overlord moving into Master Rule 5, and seeing how well that can translate into the modern metagame. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying something that's maybe a little bit weird, in that I'm not sure if this concept is the most optimal way to pilot the deck. Now, this seems pretty strange in terms of a tournament that is designed to see what decks can do like this if given back their tools from the ban list, but there's two key reasons I want to play a wise strict centric build. The first is that I think that this above all does the best job of sort of exemplifying the strengths of Tiger as well as potentially its weaknesses if we were to try and revolve around a build specifically exploiting this card. So if you're unfamiliar, the entire point of the Y Strix is to get access to things like Zephyr C Elite and get more advantage along the way. But this card is classically really, really good with Lunalite because of the fact that it operates similarly to Yellow Martin and that it can just bounce your Tiger back to your hand to continue to abuse the non once per turn clause on it. And then second, it's for the content now. Come on, you guys don't want to see me play a more conservative build. I did consider playing something like a mid-range style where you just make like a bunch of rank fours, a couple of rank fours maybe, and then like DPE with like hand traps perhaps, and that could work for sure. But again, I don't think it's the best showcase of what Tiger can do. And also you guys want to see Tiger pop off in action as much as possible, right? So those are the reasons why I fundamentally came to this build and I tried to work in this direction. Again, if Tiger were to actually come back, I don't know if I would build a deck even remotely similar to this, but I think for the purposes of this tournament, that's kind of the direction that I wanted to go down. So with that out of the way, let's just go ahead and talk about some theory with the deck for itself. Now, before we delve into the specifics of the deck, I wanted to bring up four sort of uh, prerequisites or requirements that I had for the build before I finalized the list. So the first is, of course, consistency, especially with the loss of two Tiger and two Tanky. I want to make sure that the deck could combo off as often as it could. The second is maintaining the ceiling that's necessary to compete against opposing combo decks. Third is the capacity to play going second, whether it be you know playing my own hand traps or board breakers. And fourth is the ability for the deck to play through opposing disruptions, uh, which I think is obviously very important. So I think that even though I wasn't able to account for all of these equally, they all were definitely you know accounted for to some degree. And you know I think that overall this list performed pretty well, apart from just you know a lot of statistical anomalies, which we'll get into a little bit later as we go through the match review. But let's go ahead and just start off with the list here, finally, with the specifics. So in the left column, you see uh, some of the most common starters or just consistency tools that the deck has. So first up is three copies of Kaleido Chick, and then we have three copies of Foolish Burial Goods. Not much to explain here. You know, you always want to see Chick to some degree, and then this helps you get access to whatever missing piece you have by sending Perfume or the Serenade Dance. And then we have three copies of Small World and then three copies of Prosperity. So these are very interesting inclusions. So I'll kind of run through each of these one at a time. So first we'll go over Prosperity because it's easier to explain. So this one I think is a great way to make sure that you have both halves of your combo. Because remember, last time we had Tiger and Lunar was mega or meta, we had three Tiger and three Tanky. So we effectively lost four ways to access this card, which not only matters for the math on seeing this specifically, but it also means that we're less likely to actually get access to Chick as well, because in hands where you hard open the Tiger, we would use stuff like, you know, your Tanky or your Goods to get to Kaleido Chick. But now these cards are a lot less flexible as it stands, so if you would only play these cards, you really had to, or you would have to use your Goods or your Tanky a lot of the times to get the one of Tiger, but in the case where you don't open your Chick, now those options become a lot less flexible. With Prosperity, now if you open just one of these pieces, you can simply just allow yourself to have whatever avenue is necessary to go for the missing piece. And this allows you, you know, some availability to go for things like Perfume if you already open the Kaleido Chick and stuff like that. 
And even though you might be wondering, you know, this is a combo deck, you don't really want to get rid of your extra deck resources. And it's true, you don't want to relinquish a lot of your extra deck. I think it's worth the sacrifice. And a lot of these rank fours, especially right around here, are utility based rank fours, anyways. So you're not likely going to be going through them for every single matchup. These are meant to cover a wide matchup spread. So you can afford to banish definitely three and even sometimes six if you're in a pinch just to be able to make sure that you can play in the first place. I think be, being able to play is top priority and a lot of the times if you're you know, relying on cards like Allure of Darkness or Dangers, you're not guaranteed to actually ever get into these cards. A while Prosperity is not a guarantee either, you know, seeing three deep or six deep is a lot better than drawing two or one. And in general, I would rather have that option to be able to make sure that I had the highest chance of seeing whatever I was missing at that given moment. So I think that's pretty easy to explain. Additionally, the draw restriction doesn't really matter because the only card that draws in this deck is Emerald Bird, and that is far from the primary source of consistency in this deck anyways. Now going on to Small World. This, I will admit, is maybe not the best way to remedy the problem of seeing less Tiger or just having less Tiger access. But what's nice about Small World is that the way that I built the deck Every single monster in here, no matter what you open, if you open it with a small world, you can get access to either Clyde of Chick or Tiger. So I'm going to pull you guys over to a very, very handy dandy site. This is Killburn's deck optimizer for small world. If you guys do not know what this is, I will leave a link to it in the description below. But essentially, you can input whatever YDK file you have here. Uh, this is the list minus Foolish Burial because artworks are different, obviously, and you know sometimes these get messed up. But all the monsters are here and present. And this allows you to kind of see what the small world bridges are, right? So in the bold uh, is the card that you're essentially trying to fetch for, right? Given whatever, you know, small world stuff you have in your hand. And then these uh, kind of white bullet points are the bridges. And then the black bullet points are the ones that you can actually reveal uh, from your hand initially. So basically, if you open any of these, you can activate small world, uh, banish this, and then Suchinoko from your deck and then get access to Clyde of Chick this way. And so you'll notice that the number of unique monster names in our deck is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so because there are 12 total targets to add, since it doesn't include itself, obviously, because that doesn't really make sense, you wouldn't want a card to search itself via Small World, this means that every single other name besides Clyde of Chick can get to Clyde of Chick. And that is very important. And you can see this is true for both Kaleidoshik and Tiger. So all 12 of the other names besides these ones can get access to the other. And that's very, very important. So in the matches that you might have seen that people thought, oh, you know, why is Gamma in the list if it's not a small world bridge? Well, it is, but as we'll get to later, it didn't actually matter if I use small world as a bridge because I didn't have either half of the combo and you need both of them to actually play. Which again is a statistical anomaly. So... Uh, this You can see the bridges are Photon Thrasher and Danger Suchinoko. What's nice about Suchinoko is that it's level 3, but also is 0 defense for the Cypher and Gear Gamma. So that's how you can bridge this into Tiger as well. A lot of really unique synergies here. Uh, you can play things like Lunalite Wolf, which I was playing in the list before, but I wasn't playing the fusions in the extra deck, so I cut it for this card, which I think is standalone better. Uh, I guess this technically can conflict with Prosperity, but it's a 1 of Danger uh, that you're not trying to actually draw anyways, so it's fine. And so this card is essentially just anything that you need, given the fact that you have the other uh, half of the, kind of half of the combo, right? And that's the same premise with Prosperity. So both these cards kind of act in a similar fashion to where if you have either Chick or Tiger or Goods or Foolish Burial or Tanky, and in some cases even Perfume, uh, you can actually get access to whatever you're just missing and then kind of just proceed to play from there. So I did like this. Um, just overall as a concept, it's unfortunate that my brick was partially due to small world. Uh, and so I think you can get away with maybe replacing this with something else that is you know, more to your liking. Uh, things I considered included Armageddon Knight as more additional copies of Collider Chick. I didn't want to play that because it plays harder into hand traps like Valor, Ash, Gamma. Um, and then you can also play stuff like Zodiac Barrage, where if you open Barrage plus Collider Chick, you can go into something like uh, Brotherhood of the Firefist Fist Tiger King to set Tanky, and that gets you access to Tiger that way. The thing is, is that like that's less flexible than something like, you know, if you open Martin plus Barrage, because then you have to do weird stuff like link away the Tiger King into like gravity controller just to enable your Tiger. But then you have like less bodies on the field and you waste a lot of space. So Barrage wasn't like the most consistent thing for me. You could also maybe play Lure of Darkness, definitely not with Prosperity, obviously. 
But again, I feel like these are the more surefire ways to get you into your engine. And while Armageddon Knight and Barrage are certainly good options, uh, and I would consider playing those, um, you know, Small World, I think, was also just a very, very solid choice in terms of what its purposes were for the deck. So yes, if you open Small World with any of the monsters you see in the main deck, you can get to either Chick or Tiger. That's very, very important. All right, next up is the Extender. So we have obviously the Lonely Tiger. Um, maybe we'll come back one day, hopefully. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, we have three copies of Perfume, obviously crazy card. Foolish Burial, more consistency, tanky consistency. Call by the Grave is something that is actually maybe cuttable. Really, it's there to stop mostly Droll or like Ash on your searchers because you know Ash actually did hurt this deck. People were smart back in the day. A lot of the times, if you ask the Tenki, back when both Tiger and Tenki were at three, guess what? That would sometimes be enough to stop your turn because you actually needed two halves of a very specific combo and you relied on cards like Goods and Tenki to get you to the other half. And that's something that I'll kind of touch on later. Um, so yeah, of course, Call by the Grave is good for that kind of insurance. Not always good against you know the other high impact hand traps, which you get hit by often, but I think it's enough to justify its spot. Next up is Serenade Dance, very, very classic, Search Ball Martin, able to combo with goods and stuff. And then we have the other Lunalite names in the Emerald Bird and two copies of Yellow Martin. These were standard ratios, and I don't see any reason to up them. Maybe you could up Emerald Bird if you wanted to really dig for, um, you know, these cards via drawing. Uh, you can get rid of stuff like Serenade Dance, which is pretty cool, but overall, I didn't really think it was super necessary. Uh, I already mentioned Thrasher and Tsuchinoko are essentially just small world bridges, but they're decent on their own too, as just kind of extenders uh, if you draw them in your opening hand. And then we have the Dark Winged Beasts, which are not only targets for Wise Tricks, but also targets for Vortex Tricks, which are you know, both able to tutor for these cards. So uh, what the combo typically involves, as we'll show later, is using Force Tricks to get access to Singing Lanius, and then you turn those into Wise Tricks. You go ahead and Wise Tricks them in on Zephyros. Typically, you'll have Martin Bounce, so you go ahead and use those to make a second copy of Force Tricks. Use that to grab the Raider's Wing, and then you'll be good to go from there. Um, so that gives you a lot of extension and the ability to set up the rank up Soul Shade Force, which is an engine requirement uh, for the Wise Tricks. Now, this card is interesting. This card, I will say, did not come up a single time in the tournament apart from it being a brick. And so I want to talk about this because it does make your end board more powerful, but a lot of the times you really just don't even get there. And it feels weird because a lot of the reason why you want to play the Wise Tricks is obviously to get to the Zephyrus, but in addition to that, it gets you a free Infinity on board via the Soul Shade Force, whatever other rank up you want to play. Because I've seen other options such as, you know, things like Ultimate Falcon if you go for like the rank up Skip Force, so you can go for like the Fam Knight rank up Magic card to go for like Dark Requiem. Those are all fine options. Point being though is that the rank up spell is a brick no matter how you slice it. And so even though you want to like extract the maximum value off Wise Tricks, sometimes it isn't worth the brick and i will say i never actually summoned infinity the entire tournament so take with that what you will um so this is potentially cuttable and again one of the reasons why i am not convinced that wise tricks is the best way to go if tiger were to ever come off the ban list uh, next up is feather duster uh, i noticed that mbt put skill drain to three and i'm like draco is always in these tournaments so yeah i wanted outs to like floodgates mystic mind stuff like that and then we have just nine hand traps uh would like to play more I could play more if I really made the effort to. I could like cut this Feather Duster, for instance, or like the Soul Shade Force. But, you know, nine very high impact hand traps against what I presume to be a heavy combo slash FTK field. Uh, and so that is it for the main. Next is going to be the extra deck. So these are going to be pretty straightforward, I think. So two Force Tricks, as I just described with the combo. Gallant Granite is a cool combo, not only to search Nibiru if you're going uh, first in game one, but also with the uh, side deck theory, which we'll talk about a bit here. Uh, we have Redoer, which is very, very good, um, you know, just with being able to actually trigger the Emerald Bird and Martin effects because this is not detached for cost, it detaches for effect. Um, so you can see that uh, you detach uh, and then apply the following effects. There is no semicolon anywhere to or denote a cost. So these, in fact, do trigger both the Yellow Martin and the Emerald Bird. Uh, next up, we have the Baguska. Really, really is just play and be in this deck and not even, not even getting here. Uh, it's for when you get Nibiru or when you get hand trapped. Uh, sometimes ending on this is fine enough. It's not great, but it does the job. Uh, also, it's a good way to get into Zeus because it, in attack position, it actually can't be destroyed or targeted by card effects, which is important. Uh, next up is Evil Swarm Nightmare, kind of the go-to option against combo decks. Abyss Dweller is good situationally. Tornado Dragons for the backward matchups. Infinity is for the Soul Shade Force, which I kind of talked about earlier. Zeus is Zeus. Uh, we have Y Strix, the main choke point, and the Hand Trap Magnet, which is again another reason why maybe you don't want to play this build. Uh, next up is Mas or IP Mascarena, which is pretty decent. Uh, we have Nightmare Unicorn to pair with it. Appaloosa, which is good in the end board, and an access code to help close out games. Uh, a card that I was missing in this extra deck for sure was Cyframe Lambda. 
Um, and Lambda was definitely missed because of the fact that there were times I just had Gamma stranded in my hand. Uh, and it came up actually against the Synchron matchup in game one, where if I had this card, it would have been able to help me stop their push potentially. And if I would have top deck into something better for next turn, I maybe could have clawed my way out of it. I don't know if it would have changed the outcome of the game. It really would have depended on, you know, what my opponent was able to play. Um, but that being said, I think that this was, this is still a pretty good inclusion because, you know, you can combo with redo it to get a search for gamma and then turn on the gamma at the same time. So that's another route you can go. There's a lot of lots of different ways to go. You can play stuff like Utopic Draco Future, which I was testing with, with like even a third copy of Force Tricks. You could play, of course, the Rusty Bardish, um, although I feel like at that point, it's just a worse version of Phantom Knight. Um, but uh, I'll talk about why I feel like a lot of these builds are just worse versions of other decks, including this build you see right here. And one other thing that I want to mention in case people ask about it is why no Tri Brigades? Uh, that's something that I need to bring up. So tri brigades I feel are good in the deck insofar as you can go like Fractal, send Kits and Nerval at Karis, Karis pitch tri beast, go ahead, summon Omen, and then turn those into Farrager, Omen Search Tiger, which is pretty good. And then you have a if you have a chick, you can just go ahead and normal it or special it off the Farrager and keep comboing. The thing is, is that a lot of the times, like I feel what do you do after that, right? Because what you do after that is like you can make Appaloosa, maybe you make Bear Bloom into Revol, but that's pretty much what the existing Tri Brigade deck does, anyways. So then the only real leverage this deck has on that build is playing rank fours. And I think this build specializes in rank fours a lot better because uh, in that build, I mean, unless if you want to play Wise Tricks and the Tri Brigade, so you're not really getting access to Zephyros. So like you're committing your Martin sometimes earlier than you want to. And it becomes a whole, you know, a lot less of a strong ceiling. And you could maybe, again, build a sort of mid-range style, and Tri Brigades could play a component in that, but as far as trying to go full, full combo, uh, essentially, if you add Tri Brigades to the list, you're playing cards that uh, facilitate some good plays. Like, there are some cool synergies, like, for example, Perfume, Graveyard Effect, Pitching Nerva, like, or uh, Kit to get value. But at the same time, uh, you run into the scenario where it feels really just like a worse version of Tri Brigade Luralusk, and I think that's actually kind of the summary for this build as well, if I'm being honest. But I think the Tri Brigades especially um, would fall into that category a bit more because there's less incidental synergies uh, with that build than this build. Now, you could play stuff like Purple Butterfly to compensate for that because, you know, Fractal Sun Butterfly is pretty cool uh, as far as just getting a free extender onto the board, but it's not the greatest use of the Tri Brigades. Um, and I feel like, you know, in order to, you know, kind of strike the balance between consistency and power is difficult when you're playing such a bulky engine. So I didn't feel like it was worth it, and I definitely did not want to play both this engine and the tri engine. So I just decided to go with this because, again, this is, I feel, just a better showcase of abusing Tiger as much as possible. And then finally, we have the side deck. This was pretty thrown together, if I'm being honest, apart from the uh, last three cards. So you have Pankratop, Stark Ruler for going second, uh, Twin, Heavy Storm, which was made legal for this tournament, uh, Reboot Evenly for back row. Uh, sometimes Evenly can go in versus uh, certain... Uh, non backer decks, depending. And then we have this. We have Zephrath, Zephyr New, and the Zephyr Divine Strike. So this is pretty simple. When you go for Gallant Granite, you can just search for Zephrath. And then Zephrath sends Zephran you. And because Tiger is a scale 5, and this doesn't really have any restrictions in terms of being able to Pendulum Summon uh, other stuff, you can simply go ahead and just pen Summon out the Zephran you, because it becomes a scale 7. And this is a level six. So this searches you Divine Strike, which helps you play around uh, Dark Ruler and Droplet because there is really just no way for this deck to actually search, uh, you know, that type of negation or just ways to play around hand traps or uh, sorry, play around Droplet. Now, uh, in game one, what you would do is search Nibiru. That way you can deter your opponent if they're playing a combo deck. Uh, and that does play somewhat around Droplet Dark Ruler because like even if they clear your board, uh, they can't commit too much into Nibiru because then they'll just play right into it. And if they're playing a backward deck and they drop you or drop it or dark ruler you, then like it's not really that big of a deal. So that's why I figured that this theory was fine. Uh, I played it over like the time thief package because even though Winder could search retrograde, which is like a much better and cleaner way to do it than like playing bricks, and of course this did come into play um, in the top eight match as well, uh, being a brick that is. Uh, I just felt like this was a lot more accessible, being like a tool in the extra deck rather than having to just hard draw the winder. And you could argue that things like Prosperity help dig for it, and you can like small world bridge into it too, because you know the um, the winder is a psychic, so like that work or that works pretty well with like just bridging with uh, Photon Thrasher right here. But I ultimately decided probably wasn't worth it. I mean, I maybe would change that in the future, but this is something I just wanted to test out because I never got a chance to do it in the TCG. I always thought about it. And I'm like, you know, this is a tournament where I feel like it's good to kind of experiment and see how high the ceiling could be. I'm glad to report that it did come up one time. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if I would ever play this again. 
Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and just showcase the quick combo before we get started with the match review. So this is going to be a very fast demonstration of what Check Tiger does in this build specifically. Again, you can experiment with playing more extenders and just ways to play uh, even more cards if you want to incorporate engines like the Rusty Bardish and Fam Knights and stuff. But this is what I came up with with just the build that you saw previously on screen. So we're going to kick things off with, of course, summoning Collider Chick, and then we're going to use the effects to send for cost a copy of Yellow Martin. Then we're going to scale Tiger, use Tiger to bring back the Martin, bring that to the field. Then we're going to go and overlay for our first copy of Force Tricks. And then here, Force Tricks is going to detach the copy of Yell Martin in case we get hand trapped here. And that's going to search ourselves a copy of Singing Lanius. Then we're going to special Singing Lanius to the field and then link these two away for a copy of the Y Strix. Y Strix on summon is going to allow us to summon a copy of Zephyrus the Elite from deck. And this can't be used as link materials, so we have to go for another rank four, which is where Yell Martin comes into play, bouncing our Tiger to bring itself back to the field. We're then going to follow up with another copy of Force Strix over here. And then we're going to detach, doesn't really matter which one, but Zephyrus is a safer one. We're going to go ahead and add a copy of Raider's Wing. And this triggers the mandatory effect of Y Strix since we activated the effect of a Rave Raptor Exceeds monster while this is already on field to set a rank up spell directly from the deck. Then we're going to activate that said rank up spell, which is the Soul Shave Force, bringing back the first copy of the Force Strix that we linked away with. And then we're going to go for Cyber Dragon Infinity. Next, we're going to go ahead and activate the Radius Wing, detaching the other material off of our Force Strix, summoning itself to the field. And then we can go ahead and scale our Tiger that we bounced earlier off the Martin and use the effects to bring back either of our Luna Lights. We don't really need to send more off Collider Chick at this point, but we can if we wish to. Let's just go ahead and send if we want. Then from this stage, we can go ahead and go for a myriad of different things depending on what you play in the extra deck. Here, what I was going for was going for Gr or Gallant Granite to play around main deck Forbidden Droplet or Dark Ruler. So we have this way at least a way to deter our opponent in the form of searching Nibiru. And then we can go for something like an Appaloosa with these three. Uh, and then we can go ahead and activate the effect of Zephyros that bounces our Tiger, sums itself to the field, we take 400, and then we scale Tiger one final time to go ahead and bring back another level 4 to go for a rank 4 play. And then this rank 4 can be pretty much anything on our extra deck. We can go for, for the sake of example, a copy of Nightmare. You probably don't want to do Baguska because that shuts off your own infinity. But uh, this is kind of the basic setup. Uh, you can do obviously a lot more if you have more extenders, if you open Perfume. Uh, you can obviously end on different things based on what your extra deck looks like. You can obviously do like Dagda Scythe stuff. Uh, you can easily go for uh, Rusty, like I mentioned. You can go for Simor because, of course, the Y Strix is a winged beast. Uh, you can go for F0, Draco Future. You can do a lot of different things with this extra deck, but I'm showing a very, very basic kind of streamlined build. Uh, that way, uh, we have the ability to end on still a pretty powerful board, especially against combo. Uh, this helps out against backward decks if necessary. And we have a way to play if our opponent does main deck Dark Ruler or Droplet, which I think is something that's pretty important because uh, even if you go like Dive to Scythe, uh, we don't have a way to play around Droplet, unfortunately, unless if we go for Dive to Scythe and DP, but that's a lot of bricks when you count for the Y Strix package already. So, you know, take with that what you will. That's kind of all the options that I had available. But let's go and now review some of the matches that we had in the tournament itself. So our top 16 match was up against Invotes.Matica, and right away we have to play against one of the heavy hitters in the format right in round 1. But you can see that our game 1 hand is quite solid, and if nothing else, this one is a pretty solid demonstration of what the deck is designed to do from a combo perspective through hand traps, which obviously is very important. Our opponent opened very well as you can see, apart from the Celestial that's in their hand, but they had two hand traps that were very very good against us, plus a copy of Nadir's Servant, which is, out of the three engines, the one that I want to see the least, simply because Winda is a card that our engine has no native way to deal with. Thankfully we're going first, however, and we're going to activate this copy of Tenki to search for Collider Chick. Now one thing that I want to bring up right here is that everybody in the tournament had access to each other's deck lists. And I don't just mean the archetypes, I mean the exact lists. And that's because not only did Joseph stream which lists made it into the tournament on Twitch, but there was also a uh, channel on the Discord where everybody was to submit the list that they were going to be playing. So uh, I actually knew my opponent was on main deck to draw, so that was something that I checked for, but everyone was looking at each other's lists, so it's fair game. People were looking at my list as well, uh, and they already knew about the side deck Zephyr package. But yeah, uh, now that I know that there's no draw on their list, uh, I don't have to really fear much. Even still, I had Gamma to stop it. Uh, so we're going to play in such a way that tries to check for various different hand traps. So we're going to go and activate Collider Trick to bring back the Emerald Bird that we sent off of it instead of Yellow Martin. And I want to see if my opponent you know, uses Imperm on this or anything. Unlikely, but in the rare, rare, rare event that they do, um, we got some free value off of that because we didn't actually need this to resolve. Uh, 
Now we pitch Joe and Martin so that we can go ahead and grab Serenade Dance to get some uh, more value off of our Perfume discard. And we get very lucky in drawing into Tiger. However, this was not at all necessary, even though they have Ash for the Perfume, which I'll explain in just a bit. So we're going to grab Serenade Dance here, and then we're going to activate the Perfume, which is of course going to get Ash because they don't want us to get access to Tiger. Now, even if we did not have Tiger in our hand, what the play was going to be was what we do right here, which is overlay into a copy of Four Strix, and we're going to search for Zephyrus. And then the plan was going to be, we use the Serenade Dance to discard the uh, Zephyrus, summon Tiger directly from the deck, and then we go ahead and use Martin to bounce the Tiger from the field, because it doesn't have to bounce from the Pendulum Zone, of course. So uh, we had a plan to get to Tiger regardless. Um, if they would have gamma there, then so be it. But, um, you know, we had a way to get to Tiger, even if we didn't just straight up hard draw it off of that Emerald Bird, which was admittedly very lucky. But we did, so we actually are a little bit further ahead into the combo. We get an extra body for free, then we can just scale up the Tiger and then go into the Collider Chick. And then I use Zephyrus here a little bit early because I want to make sure that if I get hand trapped on Y Strix, I got as much value of Tiger as possible. Uh, and you can see that they have the Gamma for it. But even if they had something like an Imperm or a Veiler, uh, this way I would have been able to bounce the Tiger not only with the Martin this turn, but also the Zephyrus. So it would have gotten uh, basically two extra bodies that I wouldn't have otherwise if I had just searched for like a Singing Lanius and didn't adapt to the fact that the Serenade Dance is engraved. So obviously, you know, the fact that some of these combos are a little bit malleable is pretty good. But yeah, we're going to go to Y Strix. That's obviously going to get gammed. And, you know, no big surprise here. This is going to be hand trapped every single time. Uh, we're going to scale up Tiger, thankfully, because, you know, we have a lot of uses for it. And I, ha I count the number of bodies that I have, which is five, because I had three right there. And then I haven't used Martin yet. So that's the fourth. And then whatever I bring back is going to be five. So, you know, it's a little bit of an awkward number because we can't make enough rank fours. We can't make an we can't make exactly two or exactly three rank fours. Uh, so I go into Redoer to make up for that because Redoer detaches for effect, so it triggers the Emerald Bird. So we're gonna bring back one of these Collider Chicks and then we're gonna go ahead and send another copy of Martin. So this is now six bodies instead of five, which means that we have the math to go ahead and do uh, either two more rank fours here or link two plus rank four. And this is a point where maybe it would have been nice to have uh, you know, Cyframe Lambda or Cyframe Lambda which is fine, but I didn't think it was super necessary uh, in this specific case. Uh, it didn't come up as much here as it did in the next match, which you'll see. But yeah, we end on Redoer plus Mascarena plus Dweller through two hand traps, which is pretty solid. And the reason I end on Dweller here is because of the matchup. And so like I mentioned, out of the engines, I don't mind as much seeing Alistair because I can always spin it away with Mascarena. Uh, but what I do care about is the Nadir Servant because if they see that and they can send App Clone, that's very, very bad because they can break our board and then they can go into Winda, and Winda just shuts us off completely. So what I do is I make Dweller so that if they open a Deer Servant, which they did, they can't send a copy of App Cologne to get value off of it, and they would have had to like hard draw the Schism, which if they're good enough to draw that, then fair enough. But yeah, we did actually successfully play around it, which is the best card in their hand right now. So they're going to activate it, they're going to go ahead and send Omega to search for Flutely. Now my opponent messes up a little bit, uh, because they were planning on going into Verite to try and break the board. So their initial plan was to go for Ecclesia to search for Punishment to help break the board that way, which would have been very, very effective, by the way. Um, but instead, they go ahead and not use the effects because they were thinking of going into Verite, which is why they don't want some of the Ash right here. Uh, when they go to activate the Fleur de Lis, I actually don't uh, use Mascarena, even though I know it's going to get negated because like, if I summon Unicorn, they're just going to negate that instead before it gets a chance to activate, so not really much of a point. I want to keep my bodies on the field and force them to just attack over, or pick basically one of the rank 4s to keep on the board, or the Mascarena itself, I suppose. Um, by the way, we drew into the mirror off of the uh, redo of grabbing Fusion Destiny, which is pretty nice. But yeah, they know old Ash and then realize that they locked out of a Nadir Servant, so they just attack over two of our monsters and then pass. Uh, they actually leave Redoer, which is the one that I wanted them to keep. So I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, we draw a Photon Thrasher, which is obviously dead right now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pick up another spell off of the Redoer. So you can see our Prosperity is not going to be live this game because we just keep drawing. And this is one of the issues with the Lunar Light right now, actually, is that it has a hard time converting Tiger into meaningful follow-up because Tiger is going to only represent three bodies, which means that if your board gets cleared like mine did, uh, you can't make Axis Code or Boros or just directly unless you commit to your normal summon, which you know, I have a normal summon right here, but it's not pretty. And the other thing is, is that uh, if I made Axis Code right here, Axis Code would have been only uh, 53 plus 24, which is 77, and that's not enough for a game. Uh, not to mention the fact that all my Link monsters are dark, so I wouldn't even be able to pop everything on their board. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things, is that, you know, Boros Sword was traditionally very, very good in this deck, and this is a very strong argument to keep Boros Sword in the list. 
um, because that might have been game. Uh, let's do the math here. So if it if I did a uh, Boral Sword into Fleurdely, it would be gaining 15, so 45, so that's 3,000 damage. And then 45 here, and then Redoer over this, which actually wouldn't have been game. <laughs> uh, so that would have been 100 shy of lethal. Uh, there's maybe a way for me to do it there, but we're not going to waste time here. Uh, so what I do instead is go make Appaloosa just to control the board. And it's going to be hard for me to out this Ecclesia, actually, because like uh, it can't be destroyed by battle, obviously, with any, either of these two monsters. So I have to Unicorn spin it, pretty much. So play passes back to them. Uh, or I could have Access Code popped it, but again, Access Code wasn't game, and I wanted some defense, because if it went for Access Code, popped the board, but left the board and redo your Access Code, uh, my opponent could realistically top deck a lot of things to get out of it, like many, many different things, like Alistair is the most, no or most noteworthy one. So I pass on this instead. Uh, they draw a Call by the Grave, they're going to Omega put back Fusion Destiny, uh, they could put back my Martin, I mean, but it wouldn't have made a difference, because they would have just you know, brought back Kaleida Chicken and sent the Martin directly anyways. Uh, they switched the Clasio to defense position, which is a bit of a problem for us, and they set Call by the Grave. So we're going to end phase, you know, draw another card. This video has been putting in work here. And then we draw the Psychic Soldier that rides into battle. So in standby phase, uh, we go ahead and grab a monster this time around. Uh, not really going to make a huge difference. So we're going to go Tiger, bring back Chick, and then they're going to call by the Martin, which is which would have been very bad news for us because I'm thinking, okay, the only way I can out Ecclesia is like by linking away everything into Unicorn. But that plays you know pretty hard into whatever top deck they have because, again, that wouldn't be game. And then I realized, wait, I have Driver in hand, so I can just Tribute Summon Driver and attack over Ecclesia. Now, to be fair, I had Foolish Burial. I got a Foolish Burial sent Emerald Bird to get one of these Banished Vale Martins back. Um, so that would have been okay. But um, that, I mean, this is funnier, so we went for this play. And that is the end of the game. Our opponent wanted to see the top deck, which is why I did not attack here. Uh, but Joseph already explained that in his video. So we take game one right here. And here in game two, we're going to be forced to go second, of course, and you can see exactly how much the deck struggles against the Winda if we just simply don't draw the out to it. So we drew the Gamma this time around as well, but our opponent has Alistair plus the Zero Servant, which is very, very strong. So we're going to have the Gamma for the Alistair, but they have the Ash for a Gamma too, and that's big because by the time we can use a Gamma next, uh, they're going to have the Macabre on field already, so they're pretty much insulated, especially because they have a free card to pitch for it. They're going to go through the Macabre line and then add back the Alistair right here, and then they're going to activate the Nadir Servant, and I would love to use Gamma on this app clone to deny them access to Schism, apart from the fact that if they hard draw it, they hard draw it. But uh, yeah, that's never going to be resolving with Makaba on board. So they have access to the Schism, they're going to pitch it, they have Ecclesia in hand, and they're going to go and grab a copy of the Maximus. And we don't have anything to kind of like help us uh, up against this package specifically, so uh, they're going to get the Construct to go and add back the Schism, and they're going to go to Tanaclad and End Phase for a Fleur de Lis. So just like that, they have two interruptions, holding the Call by the Grave just in case they have, um, or we had like a Lightning Storm or a Twin Twister or something. And, you know, they have Schism, which by itself is enough to just win the game. And you can see right here, we have a lot of different options to try and draw, uh, because we have the Emerald Bird and we have the uh, Suchinoko. So we're going to go and try our best to draw into our Dark Ruler, which we cited into the deck right here. Because um, you can see, yeah, we we're on the Dark Ruler, and, you know, we had, like, Twin Twister, and we had Red Reboot in here. But, yeah, we just didn't draw anything to deal with the Schism. It is what it is. Uh, and the opponent realizes that with the Suchinoko, we're just trying to draw into outs, so they banish it. And then off the Foolish Goods, just wanted to see if the top spell of the deck was Dark Ruler. It wasn't, so we're just going to go ahead and pack that one up. Now for the all-important Game 3, and you can see that we opened the Zephrath right here, which raised a lot of questions, and a lot of people were super confused about this one. But hard drawing this one is actually fine, because you were going to search it off the Gallant Granite anyways. And our opponent drew Gamma once again, so it was going to be hard for us to get access to the Gallant Granite without sacrificing a lot of resources. Um, so that's pretty good. Their hand is <laughs> substantially worse than ours, however, they drew Dasher and Celestial and Aerial. So um, yeah, unfortunate for them. Uh, we drew kind of weird, but definitely enough to make it work, especially with Prosperity. And to take a bit of a risk here, I only banished three, but to be fair, there's a lot of things that we could draw here. We could draw Tanky, we could draw Small World, we could draw Chick, we could draw Perfume, we could draw uh, Tiger itself, we could draw Foolish Burial. We could draw any of those cards, um, or hit any of them off the Prosperity, so it didn't really matter too, too much. And we were losing to any hand trap, so I decided to just go ahead and you know play it out. So we go ahead and Tanky for Tiger, and then we Goods for the Serenade Dance, and we get rid of the Driver for the uh, Collider Chick here. And then now I'm just trying to check for other hand traps. Obviously, they don't have Droll again, so that's good. And I'm just playing out the standard Chick Tiger play, 
we're going to go ahead and activate the four strikes to go for a copy of the singing lanius and our y strikes is once again going to get gammaed you know again if you take anything away from this uh, this card is just a hand trap magnet um, so yeah that's why again i don't know if this is the best way to approach the build uh, because realistically, if you're not playing Solitaire Hands, you're never going to get to the full combo because y Strix is always going to get negated uh, via Ash or Valor or Imperm or Gamma. So that's how that kind of works here. So we still have the Yellow Martin. We're going to go ahead and uh, activate that to Bounce Tiger, scale it, and then go and summon back the Collider Chick. And then we're going to scale a Zephyrath. Right here, I'm just kind of like fumbling my way through this combo line because I did not really play in a scenario where I got gamma and hard drew the Zephyrath in this exact scenario. So I'm just trying to see what board I can make. And then we go ahead and pen summon the uh, Zephranu after sending it with the Zephrath. We search the Divine Strike, which is good insulation. And then we're going to go for four strikes because it's at this point where I realize that I did not, in fact, normal summon at all since I got access to Collider Chick via Serenade Dance. So we are actually going to be able to search for four strikes and just, or Zephyrus rather, and then just normal summon it. So that's really, really good. Uh, we can go into Mascarena. We have another Bounce for Tiger, and we can make a second rank four on top of all of this. And again, we're trying to play around a Deer Servant as best as we can. So we're making Dweller here instead of something else like an Evil Swarm Nightmare, for example. And so we pass on this board, which is not too bad, uh, especially, again, given the fact that they had Gamma, which is a very high-impact hand trap. So yeah, Dora comes down in the standby phase, and then we're going to go and uh, spin back this Alistair with Mascarena. And it's funny because I was typing to my opponent in chat right here, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't fire Mascarena just to play around evenly, because I knew that they were side-decking evenly. And literally, they drew for turn. So uh, yeah, I literally played into it. It's uh, That's a... That's a uh, feels bad moment. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and just Divine Strike negate the evenly. And thankfully, they don't have a second copy. They're going to hard fuse into DP, which is pretty funny. But against Dweller, it's actually not that good. Um, and they already used their battle phase, so they can't clear it. So yeah, we go ahead and Dweller right away. They're going to pop our Tiger with the uh, DP, which you know is not that big of a deal for us. But uh, we have plenty of ways to deal with it, uh, even if they did not, in fact, use DP. Because I would have been able to go for uh, Appaloosa into a copy of access code if they just left the dpe um kind of just like sitting here um so like we were totally fine and then we just go into access code afterwards uh and then we just go for game so uh, game one we take i think it was a pretty good showcase of what the deck is trying to do and now moving into top eight so our top eight match here is up against Synchron, piloted by Kira, and I want to give a shout out to them for doing a fantastic job piloting this deck uh, with the collaboration of fellow Yugi tuber and Synchron enthusiast 037 Wolf. Uh, definitely check out his channel; it's really, really awesome content on this deck. If you want to see more of what this deck can do in the current format, which is not fundamentally different from what the list that you're about to see is able to do, uh, and this deck really is only changing out the Cyber Synchron for the Jet Synchron, um, and you know that's. Obviously very powerful, but all of the plays that the deck has access to right now are currently illegal, so uh, just like throw that one out there. Um, I actually have a lot of knowledge of this matchup, simply because I watch uh, 037 Wolf's content a ton, uh, but that's not going to do me any favors when my hands are unplayable like this. Uh, thankfully, we did lose the die roll, otherwise we were just passing. So they're going first right here. They're going to Foolish Burial for Doppel Warrior and then bring it back off the Junk Synchron. Now, if my hand was playable, if I drew Chick Tiger or a way to access it, I would easily have dropped Gamma on this because uh, normally, like if you have Imperm or Valor, then you get punished by something like a Kaligal Cockcrow, which they had here. Uh, or, you know, they would have had like maybe a Matsu that just tribute for Starter Synchron in a different scenario. But yeah, Gamma would have left them with nothing, and they would have just been passing. But in a hand that I'm relying on a top deck to draw, which granted there is a lot of them, but uh, it's not guaranteed, uh, I would have to simply uh, hope that, you know, I would have drawn into a good card. Otherwise, they have a follow-up Junk Sync drawn to play again next turn regardless. So what I decided to do is hold and let them combo off and then try and just nib Gamma them. However, my opponent plays pretty smartly because they are anticipating hand traps. So they don't go into speeder right away. They go into uh, Excel Synchron to send a copy of Stardust. And then they go into Celestial Double Star Shaman to bring back the Doppel Warrior. And what they're trying to do here is they're just trying to get as much value off of their, uh, you know, off of their Doppel tokens and their Synchro, or sorry, Tuner Axis right here. And I am trying to just make sure that they use as many extra deck resources as they can. That way my Nib Gamma is more punishing. Um, so I let this all go through. Uh, so they go ahead and use Doppel Warrior after summoning Caligal Cockcrow and summoning Keeper Pitch. They decrease the level, they go into uh, Stardust Charge Warrior, they search for Caligal Cockcrow and draw into Dawnwalker right here, and then they go Stardust Synchron, tribute the token to summon itself, they go for the Illumination. And then they're going to go for Brion de Fleur, which is pretty good insulation now that they can go for a Chaos Warrior play with this Dawnwalker that they drew. So, uh, you know, Chaos Ruler is one of the best plays in the deck. They're going to send Trail, and then they're going to go for the Chaos Ruler. 
And right here, I'm just hoping that they extend like a lot more than this. But here they just attempt to leave main one. And I'm like, oh, and well, this is now really awkward because any top deck that I have, if it's a rototype type card, uh, is going to get negated by the Baron de Fleur, probably. Um, so I can't actually beat that if that is my only way to play the game. And even if they let that all resolve, like they could just negate my Tiger activation and that does the same thing. So I'm like, I actually just can't play through one Baron de Fleur negate. Uh, so I'm like, all right, I have to Nibiru here. Now they go ahead and they chain Fleur. I could easily just you know, not use this Gamma. And the outcome would have been the same because this wouldn't be live for uh, for my turn. And they don't really have any other extenders because they already summoned Caligula Clawcrow. I know about the uh, Doppel Warrior in their hand as well because it was picked up off the Chaos Ruler. And there's only one unknown card. So I'm like, what tuner extenders could they have? It's probably not too many. And so that's why I decided to Gamma so that my nib does go and tribute the entire board. And the other reason is that I want to get Driver out of my deck just so I have a slightly higher probability of drawing into a live card next turn. So like my live top decks right now consist of Tanky, Tiger, Foolish Barrel Goods, that's 5, uh, 3 Small World, 3 Prosperity, that's 11, 3 Perfume, that's 14. So 14 out of 34, is like the odds are not in my favor, but they are pretty good odds mathematically. So we go ahead and tribute the entire board, uh, being of course the Nib Token, or sorry, um, the Cast Ruler and then the, uh, the Cyframes. And now, of course, they get to trigger Trail and Doppel Warrior, but I'm like, I know about this, but they don't have tuners right now, so I'm not really feeling too worried. They accidentally click on Illumination. And then play passes back to us. So I'm like, All right, I know that they have Claw Crow in hand. I don't know about the Junk Synchron. And we draw what else but a copy of freaking Gamma. <laughs> so that is, you know, not one of the live draws that we had in our deck. Uh, and, you know, we are forced to simply just go into the battle phase and clear over some of their monsters and just hope that they can't OTK us. Now, one thing that I did not account for regarding follow-up was the fact that Chaos Ruler was another form of follow-up in their graveyard. Uh, and so, you know, hearkening back to what I mentioned last turn, which is like, oh, I wanted to, you know, hold Nibiru Gamma just so that they went through more of their extra deck resources. Uh, Chaos Ruler is, you know, very, very threatening in this kind of game state where I cannot actually do anything. Um, and so this is a situation, this is, one of the games where I did miss a uh, Lambda, because if I was able to go into Lambda here, then like even if they went Chaos Ruler to try and attack over the Lambda, it wouldn't do anything because I would still have a vacated board for Gamma. And so their only real life threat would be the Junk Synchron. And I obviously don't know what their top deck is going to be. And I also don't know that they hard drew a second copy of Junk Synchron. But I think that would have uh, been much better than just whatever this board is, right? So yeah, we pass back to them. They draw a Junk Converter, which you know is kind of just more redundant access. Um, and yeah, here is where, like, man, if uh, they summon the Junk Synchron, I had Gamma for it, that would have been very, very, very good. Um, but as a stands, you know, they're just going to be able to go into Synchro or Speeder, which they saved from turn one. And the game is very, very much over right here. Uh, not much we can do from this position since we don't have the Lambda. That maybe would have changed the game. They would have still had a lot of pressure on us, and we would have had to have relied on a top deck. Uh, we would be summoning some Graves so our deck wouldn't be shuffled. What's our top deck right here? It would be Goods. And so, yeah, I mean, that probably would have changed the game, actually, if I did play Lambda. So, yeah, that is what I... Th this is the one instance that I did miss having Lambda in the deck. Um, they maybe could have made other plays, to be fair. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if they had other tuner access, uh, given their hand. But uh, that's very unfortunate. Uh, we draw the goods too late, um, and they have a huge, huge board right here. Uh, they're going to Herald Negate. We're going to try our best. We have Gamma. They're going to just Abyss. Um, this only banishes uh, Monster Sent from the main deck to the grave, by the way, which is why they negated it. But yeah, uh, they're going to rip the Collider Chick. We're going to activate the effect in Banish Zone because it's funny. Uh, and then they're going to get our uh, Collider Chick. Even if we went for Unicorn, spin one of these. Uh, we can't clear the whole board. So uh, we just resign ourselves to our fate. And our opponent does predictably just attack us for game. So it's time for game two. And this hand is looking pretty rough. Another unplayable one. Now, before you write off this deck completely as just unplayable, uh, I want to uh, employ you to stick around to the next section of the video where I actually run a consistency simulation on DB, just running test hands until I brick. And I did that right after I played this match because I, in the moment I was thinking, there's no way this deck should be this inconsistent. Like, yeah, you'll draw bricks like this from time to time, but definitely shouldn't happen twice in a row. Uh, so stick around for that part if you're interested. Uh, but to explain the brick itself a little bit, so these two cards obviously are very, very bad to draw, and I'm not going to deny that, especially the Divine Strike, which is admittedly part of a gimmicky package that I wanted to test out uh, and see how good it would actually end up being. Um, so yeah, I will fully admit to that, that this is not like the best thing that you could play. But to be fair, even still, 
Uh, I actually did not replace any engine cards to accommodate this post side. So my side outs were one copy of Nibiru, one Droll, and one Harpy's Feather Duster. None of those would have helped in this scenario in terms of consistency. So the only way to remedy this problem would just be to play more like hard engine cards like Armageddon Knight in the main or something like that. So like Armageddon Knight here would have fixed his hand. Uh, here And then we have the Soul Shade Force, which is part of the Y Strix payoff. But this is kind of what my point is, right? We drew this in game one and game two, which I mean, that's already a 1 in 64 chance of happening roughly. So unfortunate, but uh, even despite that, I think that this goes to show why what I said at the beginning of this video is kind of the case in the fact that Y Strix is maybe just not the best way to play this uh, deck if Tiger were to come off the list. Because A, you're never resolving the combo as we've seen in the Evoked Dogmatica pack, er, matches. Like, we just never got to resolve Y Strix. And B, uh, the deck building cost is probably just not worth it because you draw these more often than maybe statistics will suggest. And then to explain Small World, because I know a lot of people are going to get on my case for this one. All right, so yes, Small World is live here. Uh, people think that, oh, Gamma's not a Small World bridge. Why are you playing it? Well, as I already established in the deck building session, every single main deck monster in this deck gets you to either Chick or Tiger. The thing is, is that if I Small World into Chick or Tiger, what am I doing, right? Because there's nothing else in this hand that will help facilitate this combo. This is the only engine card in the entire hand here. And of course, it's a once per turn. So even if I drew another monster like a Nibiru, instead of this Divine Strike, it still wouldn't have helped. So again, I could, I could get access to Collider Trick here, but I wouldn't be able to do anything. So I just pass here because Gamma should be enough to at least deter my opponent for one turn. So my opponent draws it. They have a very, very good hand right here. So even if we were able to play, they had Droll and Evenly. Uh, so yeah, they go ahead and pick up a copy of Junk Synchron, and we go and Gamma this, which is enough to actually stop their turn right, in, or right about now, which is good. But uh, here's the problem right now, and this is the problem with Small World, is that we're in a situation where it doesn't matter what co or card we top deck. There is no card we can top deck that gets us out of this, because our deck requires two cards to play. And that's the problem with Small World, is that like this is kind of like a reservation spot, if you will, uh, because like we needed a card to be able to get rid of for Small World, but the card that we you know wanted to p uh, send for it is a card that I had to use to stop our opponent from just destroying us, right? Um, and so we draw for turn. It's a pot of prosperity, but even if we draw like a Small World Bridge or Chick or Tiger directly, we're still in the same scenario as last turn where we just don't have a way to get into Engine, and that's due to drawing not enough monsters to accommodate Small World. So here's a scenario where, yeah, if we drew Nibiru or Droll um, instead of this Divine Strike, that would have been good because Nibiru being sent away for Small World plus a Prosperity into an Engine card would have gotten us there. Now, to be fair, not against Droll, uh, but in general, that would have been a pretty uh, that would have been a pretty good scenario for us. So yeah, again, it does not matter what we hit here because it won't fulfill both halves of the combo. And this is a problem with Lunalite that I'm going to bring up in the final part of this video. Lunoi is a deck that, unlike pretty much every other combo deck you see today, requires two very, very specific cards in order to combo. There are two card combos in the game for sure, but all of them are very malleable or flexible or don't require like specific names to work. Uh, these require specifically Chick and Tiger, or Chick and Perfume, which eventually feeds into Tiger. And if you don't get access to that, then you're kind of just out of you're just kind of out of the game. And so, yeah. I think my mistake here was like prosperity for six because realistically, like I mentioned, it doesn't matter what I hit here. So I should have just done three, knowing the fact that it didn't matter. So the motivation for picking up Nibiru here, again, this is a small world bridge. I want to make that abundantly clear. I can small world away here, Nibiru, to get into either Chick or Tiger. But again, it doesn't do anything for me because I don't have both halves of the engine. So the goal here is that they see me pick up Nibiru. So they won't full combo. And then I can hopefully draw into something else so I can small world this away. Uh, it's not a great game plan, but it's the best thing that I got. It's the highest percentage chance that I have to win. And so that's what I take. Uh, they go and pick up a droplet. So now they have like way too many answers for me to deal with. Um, so like even if it was able to combo off, now they have droplet and they have droll. Uh, plus they have crystal wing in five summons. So uh, this Nibiru, it achieved its purpose in so far that they didn't like actually full full combo. But yeah, we have to deal with crystal wing as well. Now, if we were able to go chick tiger, we could play past one crystal wing, but not crystal wing backed up by droplet and droll. And we do draw another copy of Prosperity, and this is the one that maybe I should have done 6-4, so I just kind of did it backwards. But as it stands, I don't want to give up all my extra decks, so I just banished 3. Uh, we hit Tanky, which is good, but then now, as we fi are finally able to play, we get hit with Joel. So I mean, that's just kind of how it works. Uh, so we finally do a full combo, but 
Yeah, they held Joel the entire time, just reading the fact that their hand was weak because we passed turn one. They draw another copy of Joel. What can you do? Uh, they're going to play a main phase two. They could have just OTK'd me, but um, I guess they're fearing like Nib Gamma or something like that, or, like uh, Gamma plus another hand trap, which is uh, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, they just play under five summons. They don't want like me to Nib Gamma them here. And then uh, put, they pass back to us. We draw a Serenade Dance. It doesn't really matter what we draw here, to be fair. Um, the fact of the matter is that we have full combo, but we're just going to get Joled again. And that is kind of just that. So we resign ourselves to the fact that we have lost this one. Uh, and that is very unfortunate. So that ends our top eight run. So this section of the video was just for me to confirm personally to myself that the deck was not as inconsistent as that top eight match would lead me to believe. Because, man, I was really demoralized after that one. And I kid you not... As I mentioned, I hopped right into Dueling Book Solo Mode after that match happened, and I just solitaired and wanted to see how many hands I could get through without bricking, right? I just wanted to see how consistent the deck was, and you know, if I bricked a lot, you know, fair enough, maybe that's just the way the deck is built, but I'm like, I'm fairly certain I built the deck to be consistent. That's one of the main things that I checked for. Um, so yeah, count along at home how many hands we are able to play through uh, before we uh, come across a brick hand. So this hand, looking a little bit dicey, but with Prosperity, we don't even need to do 6 because we have Tiger plus Perfume, so pretty good. We have Chick Perfume, um, so that's a very playable hand. Next one right here, oh look, we have a Chick Perfume again, so pretty solid. Uh, third hand, we have Chick Perfume again. Alright, maybe we're getting a little bit lucky here, but let's keep going. Uh, so this hand, we have a Chick plus Small World plus Goods. Hey, look, we have Goods, so we would go and send a copy of Perfume to add Tiger, and even if we get Ash, we have Small World, so we can even play around Ash in this hand. Pretty solid. All right, next hand here, what do we got? So we have Tiger, plus we have Goods. So we're going to send a copy of Perfume. We can search for Kaleidochick. We can even send Serenade Dance. Uh, we are in a pretty good spot here. All right, nice. Next hand. All right, what do we have right here? So we have Small World, looking a little bit weird, but we can Small World away, uh, Nibiru and Thrasher both being only light, to get access to Kaleidochick, which are both only level fours. All right, we have Chick Perfume again, just like that. Cool, let's move on into the next one. All right, we have uh, a pretty interesting hand. We just have Chick Tiger straight up, so that's fine. Uh, sometimes just draw the Tiger. All right, this hand, we have Prosperity and Small World. We don't even need the Prosperity here, though. We can just simply get away or get rid of the Gamma, you know, get rid of the Nibiru because they're both light. And then we can search Tiger because that's also a light. Cool, we have Chick Tiger just like that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All right, we have Small World and a bunch of Collider Chicks. That's fine, we can just get rid of one of them. Reveal a Thrasher, both only level fours. Reveal a Tiger, both only lights here. And just like that, we are back to Chick Tiger, crazy. All right, next hand, let's go ahead and uh, look at this. So, all right, we have Chick Perfume, pretty lucky, but I mean, uh, you are bound to draw two three ofs every once in a while. All right, we drew Chick Perfume and Tanky. All right, next one, we drew Small World. All right, Small World fixes his hand again. We can go ahead, get rid of one of these Spare Nibirus. We can reveal to go ahead and search for Collider Chick. Now we have Chick Perfume. All right, cool. Uh, let's go to the next hand. This is looking pretty consistent, if you ask me. Uh, going ahead and uh, going for Chick Perfume. All right, we draw that combination, to be fair, quite a lot. But you can see that Small World and Prosperity definitely put in work. And here we go. Finally, we drew a brick hand where we hit the Sujinoko, and that's it. Okay, so this is the first brick in all these hands. Uh, I didn't actually count. I'm going to do that in editing, but that had to have been at least 10 hands. So... Um, take with that what you will. Obviously, some of those hands were lucky, and you will brick among that maybe a bit earlier, but two bricks in a row seems pretty unlikely. So, I mean, I really do think that the deck isn't that inconsistent, but uh, yeah, we got very unfortunate to brick twice in a row like that. So we have finally arrived at the end of our very long journey, and I want to wrap it up with a discussion on whether Tiger can genuinely come off the list or not. And you guys can probably already tell, but I'm going to advocate for the answer being yes. But I will run through three key reasons as to why this is the case. The first is consistency. So I think we can all agree that Tenki is probably never going to come back to more than one, just given the state of the ban list and how recent it was hit. So because of this, you have to make concessions to make things work. You're already running on two less copies of either Chick or Tiger, given that circumstance, even if Tiger were to come back to three. And because of the fact that you have to open two specific combo pieces, you're sacrificing the ability to flexibly use those uh, searchers in the form of Foolish Burial Goods or Tanky to grab whatever missing piece you need because you have fewer of them to begin with. Additionally, you have to make concessions like you see in this deck list. I'm playing stuff like Small World and Prosperity, which you can easily see are not the best solutions and they're not replacements for the additional copies of Tanky or Tiger if it were to come back to one rather than three. So I think that in a world where this is the case, uh, you have to really, really be careful about uh, you know how you can make sure that you craft a deck that opens the combo or the way to play the game as much as possible. 
Additionally, even if you are able to play uh, and you open Chick Tiger, you have to play a lot of bricks if you want to play full combo and if you want to make a board that's uh, enough to stand up to the rest of the decks out there. And that'll tie into the third point that I have here. Uh, however, uh, if you don't want to do that, you're kind of playing a more mid-range deck, which again, I think is okay, but I simply think that this is just not the best archetype suited for playing mid-range. The second point is vulnerability. And this is a very, very big one that I don't think people talk about very much, but a lot of the power is concentrated in these specific cards, Chick and Tiger right here. So it's very easy for your opponent to read what to stop because your opponent is always going to use their Cosmic Cyclone on Tiger. They're always going to ask your Tanky or whichever starters you have. And this ties in with consistency, right? Your opponent knows what cards you're trying to get to. It's no secret uh, what extenders you might have hidden in your hand or anything like that. So your opponent is going to know that even if you are playing something like a danger-oriented build, that these are ultimately the key cards that they have to stop. And so like this makes it so that a lot of your plays are going to be bottlenecked into very targetable choke points. You can think of things like Y Strix, but even if you play stuff like Curious instead, um, you're still going to put yourself in a position where you just lose to just one or two timely disruptions. And speaking of disruptions, uh, if you go a second, it's going to be extremely hard to play through a board, again, because of the fact that you are really putting yourself in a position where you have to draw specifically Tiger uh, in order to make things work. And, you know, smart opponents are never going to let that happen. Uh, also, lots of hand traps when you're going first are going to ruin your day. Uh, you saw things like Ash and Droll and Gamma just completely destroy my experience in the top eight. And there's even other hand traps like DD Crow on Martin can really, really be a big hindrance. And... Beyond all of that, even if you are able to full combo and your opponent doesn't have any way to stop you, uh, if you're going first, you ha have to deal with cards like Dark Ruler and Droplet, which the deck does not really have a native way to get to without incorporating bricky stuff like the Zephyr Package. Now, to be fair, there's other options that are probably better than this specifically. However, the point still remains that the archetype does not have a native way to deal with uh, cards like Dark Ruler and Droplet. So you really have to factor all of this into your deck building, which makes things very, very difficult on top of the fact that your opponent will still have ways to deal with your uh, engine regardless. And the third and final point is the fact that I think other decks can simply just achieve more than this deck can while requiring less out of the deck. So I mentioned already that there's a lot of engine requirements that you have to play uh, if you wanted to maintain the high ceiling, and that's very, very much true. And so because of this, I think other decks simply can just run a lot more smooth of an engine. You can think of a deck like Tribrigade Lurulusk that doesn't require nearly as many bricks to run uh, in order for that deck to, you know, arguably even produce a better board than this one. And this deck doesn't really have any one card plays, anything like Invoked or Prank Kids. Uh, even compared to other combo decks, stuff like, uh, you know, Adam Emancipator back in the day, or Dragon Link, or Drytron, or Tribrigade Lurulusk, all these decks have flexible combos that don't require specifically named cards in the fact that Chick and Tiger have to be specifically present in your hand. Uh, those cards can play with many, many different permutations of cards in their deck, and they can work both forwards and backwards, depending on how you structure things. Uh, Adam Emancipator is a good example of this. Like, you can start with Researcher, or you can use Researcher as an extender later on. You don't really have that luxury with this deck because you're always starting with these cards, and these are exactly the cards you have to see in your hand in order to combo off. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, this deck is always just going to feel like a worse version of the existing deck, unless you take it in an entirely different direction, which is potentially possible. But I think... If Tiger were to come back, honestly, its best niche might just simply be a go second fusion oriented OTK deck, uh, which might seem strange, but I think that that is a niche that is filled better th uh, by this deck than anything that is combo related because it's always going to feel like a worse Trilurilusk or a worse Phantom Knight or just some other combo deck in the format that can achieve more with fewer resources. So that's going to be my greater discussion on why I think Tiger can come back. But let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree. And thank you guys all again so much for watching this video. This one took a very long time to produce and was a lot of effort. So I'd appreciate it if you shared it around with friends. And if you want to, uh, leave a comment uh, saying Tiger to 3, uh, if you agree with me, that is. But that's going to be it for the video, guys. Uh, please check out my affiliate links as well as the Patreon uh, in the description below if you want to help support the channel and more long-form content like this. Uh, it's a lot of fun to produce, but it's very, very labor-intensive, so I would appreciate it. Um, thank you again for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, I will catch you in the next video. See you guys.